Go to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. We've been looking at the seven churches, sort of working our way through those. Those were seven churches that existed at the time this book was written. This book was written around 90 A.D. And uh, so it was about um, 60 years or so, not quite exactly, but close, 60 years after the day of Pentecost, 60 years after the resurrection of Christ. And there were seven churches in Asia. And so um, John, uh, one of the most really amazing visions that was ever given to a man was given to John the Apostle, now 90 years old, and a political prisoner on a rocky, barren prison island. What a way to end your days. And yet, in the midst of all that, he was never forgotten by the Lord. And that's always the way it is. You know, sometimes you feel like you're alone, and you feel like you're way out there. And, uh, and you know, I'm sure there's people that uh, later in life, they feel like they're a prisoner. But uh, it's a blessed thing to be the Lord's prisoner. And, um, and John was there on that rocky island. And um, man, what a glorious vision he had. Um, it opened with chapters 2 and 3, letters to seven churches that existed at that time. They were all different. Um, those, those seven churches were seven literal churches. They picture church history. And uh, they picture seven types of churches. And, um, and they picture types of Christians because Christians make up churches. And um, so we've been looking at them in view of, of, you know, different types of churches and Christians. And man, the Lord had something different to say to each one. And yet, and yet all these churches existed at the same time. So let's look at Revelation 3. And we're, we're in, in the church of Sardis this morning. Chapter 3, verse 1. And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. And of course, every time the Lord opens a note to the churches, he, he's describing himself in a little different way to each church. So who is he? Verse 1, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one with the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest and art dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which are, remain, which are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast and repent. If, therefore, thou shalt not watch. You know, you know the, the choice is always ours. You know, the, 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 a lot of the Bible translators, the guys that correct the King James Bible, they hate the word if. And they will change that word in various places. But the Lord put the word if there because it's up to you. Verse 3. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief. And thou shalt know what hour I will come upon thee. Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Lord, thank you, Father, for the wonderful privilege of being here this morning. Thank you for the songs that we've sang. And God, just the blessing of being in your house. And God, it just transports us out of this world, Lord, into that blessed world that is thine, a place of peace. And God, for, for an hour or so, uh, we can be in thy presence. Now, Lord, um, please help us. And uh, Lord, speak, we pray, to every heart. In Jesus' name, amen. The church in Sardis. Sardis was an ancient city, and it was said to have been the chief city of Asia uh, at that time. It was the first city in that part of the world that really was heavily influenced, and many people were converted there by the preaching of John the Baptist. And some folks say, historically, it was the first church that revolted out from under Christianity and decided to go a different direction. And that's interesting when you read these words 
the Lord opens it up and he says, thou hast a name that thou livest. But man, they were on the edge of death. That church was dying quickly. And they were, they were said to be one of the first churches in Asia. You know, those seven churches in Asia no longer exist. And, um, <coughs> and it wasn't long after these letters were written that most of them no longer existed. Um, he says there, these things, verse 1, these things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God. And that's an interesting phrase, especially because the word spirit is capitalized. One guy said this. He said, um, he says, this is the Holy Spirit with his various powers and graces and operations. And he is said here to be seven in number, which is the number of the churches to show that every preacher and every church is given a measure of the spirit that they might profit. Every church has a stock that is given them of spiritual influence so that they can work with that and they can be used of God unless they choose to forfeit it. Churches have their spiritual stock and fund as well as individual believers. You know, it's, it's only said of our Lord that the Spirit was given without measure unto Him. But He is given to us. And we can be filled with Him, you know, and that can fluctuate. But every believer is given their stock of the Spirit of God. And he said, this church was a dying church. And John opens this letter with a reminder that Christ has the seven spirits. And that if they want to, the work can be revived among them. Because the Spirit of God has been given to them. There, there is more than enough, even when it looks like it's too late. Look at that, um, that phrase in verse 1. The Lord says a lot in verse 1. He says, I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest, and art dead. You know, um, all the other letters, or most of them anyway, it starts off with, the Lord says, I know thy works, and then he lists a bunch of really good things about those various churches. But this church... He doesn't say anything good. Uh, he launches off from the first phrase. And, um, and he says, you know, you, you've got a name. And he says, but you're dead. This church had a great reputation. It, was, uh, it had a very honorable name. It appeared to be a flourishing church. And, um, and you got to remember, again, this is only 60 years from the day of Pentecost. You know, they weren't living in 2024 where there was every crazy error under the sun and the Internet and, and just, you know, craziness everywhere. They, they weren't living in that era. And it appeared that their doctrine was pure. The Lord never addresses their doctrine. It doesn't appear there was any disunity among them. We read of no divisions among them. Everything appeared well as far as man sees. But this church was really not what it appeared to be. They had a name to live, but they were dead. There was a form of godliness, but not the power. They had a name to live, but they had no real life there. There was deadness in their souls and in their services a great deadness in their preachers, in their praying, in the people, in hearing, in prayer, and in conversation. And what little life that was left was expiring. They had a name that they lived. Uh, boy, it's, it's an amazing thing. Um, just this past week, one of our guys, uh, it, well, it was actually a few of our people were out on White Ave on Friday night. And uh, somebody looked across the street and they, two or, th two or three of our crew, and they said, wait a minute, we know that guy. And uh, there was a Hollywood movie star, and he was uh, down there on White Ave, and he had his film crew with him. And, um, and so they're moving around on the street yesterday, and um, on Friday night, and they uh, went up to him and, you know, gave him a track, and he took it, and he was, he was decent. And um, he turned the first one down, but he, somebody else offered him one, and he took it. Um, you know, if, you, uh, if you've been following anything that's been happening recently, 
Um, there was one of the uh, Hollywood guys that uh, passed away here in the last couple weeks, and that was uh, Matthew Perry. And some of you guys, of course, will recognize his face. And, um, and so I got the article, you know, about his death. And uh, man, what, what a thing, you know, there, there are some names, you know, my name, your name, you know, um, your family knows you. And, uh, but I think for most of us, we're not very well known. Um, you know, we're just, we have our little sphere and um, sometimes that's a blessing. But, um, you know, people think, oh man, everybody knows his name. And of course, the article goes to great lengths to talk about how bad the people that were selling him uh, the drug that killed him. Um, I believe, yeah, the drug was ketamine. I, I'm not familiar with that one, but it's a, apparently a real high-powered narcotic. And uh, he had been taking that. And, and, um, and the authorities revealed in their remarks that Perry had paid $55,000 over the last two months for ketamine. And, you know, of course, you know, the article, again, they're, they're really going out of their way to talk about, man, how bad these five people were that were somehow linked to supplying him the drugs and all that stuff. And, you know, how terrible it was they weren't monitoring the amount and, and all that stuff. But that diverts from the man. Perry was 54. He was an American and a Canadian actor who gained international fame for his part um, in a certain sitcom. And they attributed his death to drowning. They found him in his swimming pool. He had coronary artery disease. They found that when they did the autopsy. And the effects of buprenorphine which is used for pain management and the treatment of opioid withdrawal. So he's on ketamine and he's on it because he's trying to get off of, you know, heroin or whatever it was. And Perry was reported to be receiving ketamine infusion therapy for the treatment of depression and anxiety. You know what these guys need? They need your pity and your prayers. Man, they've got a name. And you know, some people, you know, it's just, it's, just, it's just sort of implied. But you know, there's young people and adults that look at them really starry-eyed and go, Whoa, that's got to be the life. But that's not life. That's death. They have a name that they live. But they're dying. They need your prayers, not your admiration. Years ago, there was an actor, famous actor, and some of you old folks will remember this one. I, we don't hardly have any old, we don't have any old folks in here, but, but, <laughs> but some of you old folks will remember the name Jonathan Winters. And when I was a kid, Jonathan Edwards, how many of you remember Jonathan Winters? Raise your hand. Oh, I've got a few hands. He was the goof of goofs. He was... He was, he really was comical. He was, he was a nut. And, um, and uh, you know, and that's, that's usually the part that he played. Um, he was an actor and a comedian. He released an album uh, later on in his life where he portrayed, to get the number, 80 characters. Eight, zero. He portrayed... And a friend of mine who, who had that album said it was unbelievable. He said no two characters were similar. And this is one man portraying 80 characters. And the question is, how do you not lose your mind? But seriously, how do, you, how do you even know after a while who you even are? You say, Pastor, that's a stretch. No, that's not a stretch. Jonathan Winters, he went, over, he went over to Europe and he got arrested one day and uh, he was losing his marbles and they found him in the arms of a statue without most of his clothes on. Oh, they got a name. But they're dead. 
And God addresses a church. You know, if you've grown up in this thing, if you didn't, you, you really, you may not totally understand this, although it doesn't take long to figure it out if you visit some places. Man, there's a lot of churches where they're lively. They've got a lot going on. I mean, they've got programs and activities and groups. And, and none of these things are wrong. Okay, I'm not saying any of these things are wrong. Okay, but they've got groups and projects and events. We have some of that too. Okay, but they have projects and events and concerts and clubs and classes and causes. But you know what they don't have? Life. Man, they got a activity is not life. And what's missing in the church at Sardis was the life that only God could give. Man can generate activity and hype and, you know, and all that stuff. And, you know, you can have your greeter and it can all be welcoming and you can have people with that plastic smile, but it means nothing unless there's something holy going on in that invisible world that nobody can see and it's the world of your heart. See, only God gives life. In Ephesians 2, it says, and you... You, he was addressing believers. He said, and you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. He said, you know, he was writing to those Ephesians. He said, you guys used to worship the goddess Diana. And he said, you know what? You did that. You lived in that world, but you were dead. But he said, but then you met me and I made you alive. The Lord Jesus says. Keep your place there and look with me at 1 John chapter 1, verse 1. John writes, and he's referring back to those three and a half years when he physically walked and talked and leaned on the bosom of the Son of God. And here's what he said. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life. Now watch the wording. It says, for the life was manifested. It's interesting. You would think he would say for the person was manifested or, or the great prophet or the teacher or the miracle worker. No, that's not what he said. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. For the life was manifested. And we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. You know, all true life is going to come from the Lord Jesus Christ. It's funny, in the religious world, you know, you can talk about God and you can talk about, you know, a lot of things. But, and everything will stay pretty civil for the most part. But man, where the rubber meets the road is the name of Jesus Christ. And when you mention him, suddenly uh, it becomes polarizing. Um, in Romans 8, you don't have to turn there. It says, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Where is the, that spirit of of life. It's, it's in Christ Jesus. You know, in 1 Timothy 5, verse 6, Paul said, She that liveth in pleasure, and that's talking about somebody that's just living for themselves. She that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. You know, we have an expression. You know, we'll say so-and-so is, is, you know, they're doing this and they're doing that. And somebody will say, wow, that's a Dead end street. And you know what that means is they're going nowhere. And you know, you go down a dead end street and you, you discover there's no way out unless you do a 180. There's no way out. The Bible says, He that hath the Son of God hath life. And he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. They may have an existence and they may have money. And they may have, you know, a lot of nice things and they might have a lot of friends, 
But, um, but when the day is done and they come to the end of their life and they, or, or even way before the end of their life and they've got to answer those hard questions like, why am I here? What in the world is going on? This doesn't satisfy. There's got to be more than this. And when they can't find an answer, they try out the opioids and or maybe that's why they're asking those questions. They're taking the opioids and they're doing the liquor and they've tried all the women and they've, they've tried all the men and they've tried all the alternative things. They've tried it all. But they don't understand. There is no life there. There is no life there. Go to Proverbs 21. The, the book of Psalms is in the middle of your Bible and... Um, and if the next book is the book of Proverbs. The Lord looked down at a church. And man, if there's anybody that ought to have the life of God, it's a real church. But he looked down at a church, and, and that's probably the reason the Lord had nothing good to say, is because the very place that should have, people should have walked in and should have sent some, something holy and something good, and they would walk in and, and there was a lot of, you know, plastic Stuff. But there was no life. You know, you know, God says, I expect that in the world. But I don't expect that in a church. Look at Proverbs 21. This is an amazing verse. Proverbs 21, verse 16. The man that wandereth out of the way of understanding shall remain... And notice the word, in the congregation of the dead. You know, it's interesting. He uses the word uh, congregation. Congregation, that's a church word. The man that wanders, you know, now there again, he's, he's not referring to somebody that never heard the truth. Uh, you know, man, our world is full of those. They, they've never heard the truth. In the last, um, I don't know, in the last six months, I've talked to at least three folks, and um, I think they were all men. And, um, and they've gotten saved. And, man, it's just wonderful to hear the story of how they came to know the Lord. But all three of them, you know what their story is? They grew up in church. Oh, one of them was a woman. So two men, one lady. And they grew up in a church, and this was their final comment. They said, but, you know, I never heard the gospel. I never heard the gospel. You know what that place is? It's the congregation of the dead. And you know why it's like that? Because there's no life coming from the pulpit. The guy himself doesn't know the Lord. So how can he spread life when he has none? God says, you know what? He says, if you don't, if, if you don't understand the way, if you're not in that way, he says, you know what? The, the door swung wide open. But boy, there's a different group of people. They've heard it. They've heard it. They've heard it all. Some of them are saved and some of them are lost. And one day they go, you know what? <sighs> Let's try something else. And God says, when you do that, you don't necessarily leave church. But you wind up in the congregation of the dead. You know, um, you can have a lot of good things in a church. I grew up in Baptist churches, and some of them, you know, were, were you know, they had some good things. And I did hear the gospel lots through the years. Um, the Independent Baptist, I, I don't know about some of the other groups, but the Independent Baptist, one of the things that, you know, to their credit is you will hear the gospel a, a lot. And uh, you say, what's the gospel? That's the story of Jesus Christ Amen. and how he, the son of God. And, you, and it, starts with, it starts with him being who he is. He's not just a created being. He's not just, 
He's not just somebody up there that was really nice and God sent him down. It's not just another prophet. Oh, no, no, no. Jesus said, I and my father are one. He looked at Philip and he said, he that hath seen me has seen the father. There are three that bear record in heaven, the father, the word and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. It was God in the flesh. The word came down and dwelt among us. God was manifest. God, God was suddenly he became visible in the flesh. And he walked for three and a half years through the world that he had made. And he came unto his own people, the Jews. He came unto his own and his own received him not. But it had been prophesied in the Old Testament that he would go from the Jews to the Gentiles. And man, you hit Acts chapter 10 and even before that, God begins to let Gentiles in. But in Acts chapter 10, suddenly a door opens. And man, that's where you and me get in. And God began something that's going on to this day. It's the story of Jesus Christ. He came. He was the Son of God and God the Son. And He lived. And that day came that most people know about. They, not everybody understands it. But the day came that He was hated by the religious crowd and they took him and they nailed him to a cross. But on that cross, the Bible says, all our iniquity was laid on him. The world just decided, oh, we're going to get rid of this guy. But in the spirit world, God was taking his perfect son and laying the sin of the world. John the Baptist said, behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. He took all my sin, every crazy thing I've ever thought or done, or said, or imagined, or failed to do. Everything you've ever done, God knows the eternal amount of sin that is. And you could never pay for it. And I could never pay for it. It would never be enough. There's things you can't fix. And one of those is the record of your sin. No way to fix it. But God so loved the world, that sinful world, us, he wanted us, and He knew we couldn't fix it. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on Him, not, you know, it's, it's not everybody and their brother and everybody that's sincere. No, no, no. Man, the way is narrow. Straight is the gate, and narrow is the way that leadeth to life. Jesus said, I am the way. No man cometh to the Father but by me. And uh, I, I don't understand why people have such a hard time with that. I, I do understand because it means all my upbringing doesn't count and all my religious works don't count. And, and all these other people, what about them? You know, all these endless questions. But forget all that and just rejoice that God made a way for you. He paid your debt in His own blood. And God said, I got a gift I want to give you. And it's eternal life and I can give it to you because it's paid for. You could never pay for it. But God said, I paid for it. It's done. You don't have to earn it. You don't got to work for it. You don't have to have a vision. You don't have to get baptized into it. You don't. He says, would you open your heart and say, Lord Jesus, I have nothing but you paid my debt. Lord, I don't even understand all this, but Lord, I want it and I want you. Lord, I believe, save me. You'll do that. Your eternity is changed forever because Jesus Christ rose from the dead. He has the power to offer that to you because that's what this thing's all about is when I die, I don't really die. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. You know what that is? That's the gospel. The good news that he will save you if you'll drop your whatever. It's not Jesus plus this and Jesus plus this. And I'll clean up myself. No, he doesn't need your help. He's already paid the price. He's already paid the debt. Just open your heart with no, no deal 
and no, oh, I'll try him out. No, he's not interested in being tried. He wants to be trusted. If you believe what he did was enough, well, that's the question. Was what he did enough for you? If you believe that, he'll save you now. You know, we're going to keep talking for a few minutes, but, but you can just zone out for a minute. You can say, Lord Jesus, I believe it. I've never done this, Lord. I want you to save me. You don't ease into this. You don't glide into it and go, oh, I've, I've been coming to church. I'm feeling better. I think I'm a Christian. No, it doesn't work that way. You know, you don't glide into marriage. You don't wake up one morning and go, wow, look at that. I think I'm married. <laughs> no, there was a day and a decision and a partner was chosen. You know what salvation is? There's a day. Oh, you might not have the day on the calendar, but you remember there was a day and there was a decision and you said, Lord Jesus, I want you. You ever done that? Why don't you do it now? The Bible says, behold, now is the accepted time. I don't know if anybody reached out to Matthew Perry before he died. But boy, that, that last day, he didn't know it was his last day. You know, he took that last shot of ketamine. And everybody on the other world knew this is it. He's done. You know what? God says, if you're going to choose me, choose me now. Life. You know what God offers you? He offers you life. Look at the book of Ezekiel. You're in Proverbs. You go to the right and you'll see some big books. You'll see Isaiah and Jeremiah and a little book called Lamentations. And then you'll see Ezekiel. You know what God's all about? God's all about life. He really is. He's about life. Jesus said one day to a group of people as he talked to them. Jesus said, I came that ye might have life. He said, that's why I came. He said, you didn't have it before I came. He said, but if you want it, he said, I'll give it. He said, that's why I came. Look at Ezekiel 1. Ezekiel 1. The context of, of the book of Ezekiel is found in verse 1. Man, Ezekiel saw some things. It says, now it came to pass in the 30th year in the fourth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I was among the captives by the river of Kibar, that the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. And Ezekiel saw some really crazy, strange things that even to this day, you know, we know he, what he saw was what he saw and he really saw it. And, you know, we try to figure out what, what was some of that. And to this very day, we, there's a lot of what he wrote that we're not sure what it was. We'll find out someday. But a lot of it we don't know. But there are some things we do know. Look at verse 12. And I want you to notice there's two words you're going to see in these next several verses. And that's the word spirit and the word living. Okay, so look at verse 12. He sees these beings. And in verse 12, he says, And they went everyone straight forward. Whither the spirit was to go, they went. And they turned not when they went. As for the likeness, now watch, of the living creatures. Why did God have to say that? He's, he's, he's going to tell us something. As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire and like the appearance of lamps and went up and down among the living creatures. They were living. They weren't imaginary. They were real, very alive. Look at verse 14. And the living creatures ran and returned as the appearance of a flash of lightning. Now, as I beheld the living creatures, behold, one wheel upon the earth by the living creatures with his four faces. Verse 19. And when the living creatures went, man, the Lord just keeps, he just keeps pointing to this. And when the living creatures went, the wheels went by them. And when the living creatures were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up. Whithersoever the spirit was to go, they went. Thither was their spirit to go. And the wheels were lifted up over against them, for the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. When those went, these went. And when those stood, these stood. And when those were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted over against them, for the spirit 
of the living creature was in the wheels. And the likeness of the firmament upon the heads of the living creature was as the color of the terrible crystal stretched forth over their heads above. Man, he keeps talking about these living creatures, these living creatures. And uh, you know, that's what God specializes in is, is life. Um, you know, it's, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. And again, you know, all the new versions change that word. No, it's a creature. And God says, I make living creatures. Living. Go to Ezekiel 37. Ezekiel 37. Living. God looked down at a church and man, it should have been a fountain of life. But he said, but man, something is wrong. These people have gotten used to coming in and they're just, uh, they're just playing a part. But there's nothing real, nothing living going on. Ezekiel 37, a lot of you guys will recognize this passage. This is a famous story which was full of bones. You know, you know what that tells you? A bunch of people at one time had lived there. But they had died. It was a valley full of bones. It had been a battleground and many, 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 God only knows how many thousands of people had died in that valley. And uh, they'd been dead a long time. Look at verse 2. And caused me to pass them round about. And behold, there were very many in the open valley. And lo, they were very dry. You ever been wandering out in the woods and you come across uh, some animal bones? And, and boy, every once in a while you come across some and they're not even white anymore. They're just, they're just gray. And they're, and they're what do we say? Dry as a bone. And you know, that whatever died here, died here a long time ago. Verse 3. And he, God, said unto me, Ezekiel, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord, thou knowest. Again he said unto me, Prophesy upon these bones, and say unto them, O ye dry bones, Hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones. Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and ye shall... God says, you know what I want to do with this place of death? He says, I want to make it come alive, and ye shall live. Verse 6. And I will lay sinews upon you, that's tendons, and I will bring up flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and ye shall live, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise. And behold, a shaking, and the bones came together, bone to his bone. And when I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came up upon them, and the skin covered them above. Now watch. But there was no breath in them. Can you imagine? He, he's prophesied. And, and you know, when that, can you imagine? He, he saw this. He saw this. And man, all of a sudden, these bones, God's putting these bodies back together, you know, and, and man, it's all coming together again. You know, it's like, you know, it says one day, you know, when the rapture occurs, the dead in Christ shall rise first. And, and it says, in, you know, in, in Revelation 20, the, 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 the dead were brought up before God and, and um, uh, they were brought up out of the sea and out of here and out of there. And, and you know, of course, every smart aleck who doesn't believe in the, the miracles of God Almighty say, well, how in the world can that happen? You know, some of these people, they disintegrated in a nuclear blast. And some of them, you know, the sharks, you know, ate them and, and all that stuff. You know what? God has no trouble with that. He will have no trouble with that. All he's got to do, you know what he did? He said, let there be light. And there was light. And God began to speak things into existence. And God knows where every atom and every molecule is. And one day he'll say, it's time. Let's get it all together. And he's watching this and all these, these bones, they start coming together. But not only are the bones coming together, all of a sudden he's seeing, you know, man, there's muscles and tendons and, and then there's skin. And, but you know what? They're all, but they're all still laying there. Now he has just witnessed a miracle. But what good is it if they look normal, but they're dead? Boy, we got a bunch of Christians. God have mercy. And we got some great ones too. We got some wonderful Christians. 
you know, and Christianity's got some wonderful that are alive. But boy, Christianity's got a bunch of them. They're just, they're just, um, they just look normal and But there's, there's nothing there. And he's just watched all this. Verse 9. Then said he unto me, Prophesy unto the wind, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain that they may live. Can you imagine the adrenaline rush? Because he's, I just, I'm sure he's got a sneaking feeling what's about to happen. So I prophesied as he commanded me and the breath came into them and they lived and stood up, up upon their feet an exceeding great army. Verse 13. And ye shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of your graves and shall put my spirit in you, and ye shall live. You know what brings life is the spirit of Almighty God. It's His spirit. It's His spirit. You know, if you're, if you're a Christian, the Bible says the moment that you trust Christ, something happens inside of you. And, um, and you know what happens? It, it's, it's, you got a new nature. Yeah, you still got the old one, but you got a new nature. And all of a sudden, just, man, you're just aware Something, something's not like it was before. And man, uh, you, start, you start loving God and you start loving God's people and you start loving, the, you start loving to pray. And, and yeah, yeah, you still got your issues, you still got your battles. But, but wow, something has changed. I heard more than one guy say they lost half their vocabulary overnight. Why is that? A new spirit came in and that spirit is holy. And he doesn't come in because he needs a place to stay. He comes in to clean house. And if you let him clean the house, man, you'll feel some life. Every Christian, especially new Christian, it's wonderful to watch a new Christian. Man, they, everything's changed and, and man, they don't understand it all and, and they even say it wrong and it's just a real blessing. Well, there, was a, there was a testimony service one night in the church and, and uh, this guy had gotten saved a week or two before. Somebody in the church had led him to the Lord. And uh, the pastor said, you know, do we have any testimonies tonight? And this person got up and said, you know, I'm thankful the Lord saved me. And this person said, you know, well, the Lord helped me this week. The Lord answered a prayer. And finally, that new believer, he was a little nervous, but something was bubbling up inside. And he said, I got to tell it. Well, that's a mark of his spirit. And he stood up and said, Johnny saved me last week. <laughs> And Johnny said, no, I didn't save him. I was just on the rescue crew. <laughs> Richard Wormbron tells about a guard that was guarding him there in the, the communist prison. And he led him to the Lord and the guy got saved. And, and all of a sudden he, he started clapping his hands and he says, oh, Jesus, what a wonderful chap you are. <laughs> you got to love it. They don't have all the words right, but they got the spirit. There's something that has come alive. Do you understand that? Like, can you identify with that? I think we got a bunch of people in our churches. They want to identify with that. But that's not their story. I'm telling you, I know everybody's story is a little different. You know, some kid gets saved in Sunday school. You know, somebody gets saved, you know, out of a rough life. Somebody gets saved out of religion. Everybody's story is a little different. But do you remember when you found life? Do you remember? Do you remember? Do you remember? If you don't, let me encourage you, drop your pride. Don't feel embarrassed. Today, right where you sit, say, Lord Jesus, I missed it. I missed it somewhere. But Lord, you know my heart, I, I was, my heart was in the right place, Lord. But Lord, right now, I want to fix this. I want you. Look back at Revelation 3 for just a moment. He's writing to a church. He's writing to... What's supposed to be a bunch of believers? I mean, anybody can come and lost people. I mean, God saves lost people in His church. You know, He does it all the time. But the church, by definition, is a group of, it's, it's an assembly of people that have heard the call of Jesus Christ and they've just trusted Him and they've followed Him in baptism and they, they, they just want to live for Him. 
Okay, that's, that's what a New Testament church is. And so that's what this church, this is how this church started. Remember, this church wasn't real far removed from the day of Pentecost. But wow, something was, was messed up. In, in verse 2, he says, Be watchful and strengthen the things which are remain that are ready to die. Man, in that church, and it seemed like this was the, the prevailing element, the atmosphere of this church, was they were dying, but they seemed oblivious to that. They seemed clueless. Wouldn't it be alarming if you knew that, wow, you know, it, you know if an angel came to your house tonight, knocked on the door, and said, hey, just want you to know, heaven's been watching, and you know, you're, spiritually you're dying. You know, you'd probably take that pretty serious. And that's what this was for this church. This letter was, do you guys know where you are? Things were dying. Real prayer was dying. Fire was dying. Love was dying. A sense of building something for Christ was dying. Saving folks by compassion or fear was dying. Discernment was dying. Sensitivity towards God was dying. Holiness was dying. Marriages were dying. Families were dying. Sweetness was dying. Something had brought death in. And you know what happened is, is probably, you know, what happens to all of us. The devil is always at work to get us to allow something in that will really dampen your spiritual life. Just, just kill it. Folks became okay with activity. But everything became very predictable by choice. You know, a lot of people, they just want something really predictable. And if you know anything about the Lord, He's not predictable. Um, you know, they wanted activity without God being unpredictable. They wanted activity without any measurements. They wanted activity without change. They were okay with activity without fellowship with God. They were okay with activity without looking for the Lord. Looking for the Lord. Go with me to the book of Amos. Um, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos. Amos chapter 5. Now I'm, now I'm talking to the believers. And um, you know where a lot of real life is going to be found for you and me? There is a place where things really come alive and where you make contact with God. And that's in that secret place. The place where you, you, you pray and the Lord said, you know, and, and when thou prayest, Enter into thy closet, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. And um, I'm not talking about saying your prayers, you know, and just, just saying this little routine you say. But I'm talking about really talking to the Lord and really looking for the Lord and really seeking Him. I mean, it's a wonderful thing when you, when you get on your knees and uh, you're not in a hurry and, um, and you're alone. And, you know, maybe, maybe you're in your car or maybe you're, you know, somewhere, but you're alone. And you're in a quiet place. And, um, you know, you're not just going to say your prayers. You're not just going to say this little ritual. But you got something serious you want to talk to the Lord about. And you're going to press. And you really, really, really. You're going to pray, but, but you're, looking, you're looking for Him to be right there with you. And, and you're pleading with God. Um, you know, um, the, church at, um, the church at Sardis, you can bank on it. That was missing. You know, they say where Christianity dies is in the closet. And, you know, when people just get satisfied just with... And, and, you know, the thing that's difficult about the closet is... And sometimes God will bring you into a really difficult position. Maybe He'll bring you into a difficulty financially. Or maybe He'll bring you into a difficulty with your health. Or maybe it'll be in a relationship. Or, man, there's a hundred and one ways it can come. But all of a sudden, you're in a place where you got to have God's help. And, uh, and you're painfully... Because you can't... 
you can't deal with it. You can't take care of it. You're in trouble and you need God's help. You know, suddenly when you wind up in that place, when you're really calling out to God, um, you can't live a double life there. You know, you can come to church and live a double life. You can come to church and, and you know, you can just sort of fit in and, and you know, and everybody, everybody thinks everything's hunky-dory and, you know, and, and, you know, but you, you leave the church, you go home, you know, you start living your private life and you're an altogether different person. Um, you know what? That's, that's, that's death, by the way. But life. There's an old song that, that the old timers used to sing and we, we sing it here occasionally. And um, it goes like this. I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses and the voice I hear falling on my ear, the Son of God discloses and He walks with me and He talks with me and He tells me I am His own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever known. God's, God's intention is that this thing of you and the Bible, you come to church and that's wonderful, but church is just, you know, a few hours a week. And God's intention is that the church is just pouring gasoline on what you're already doing at home. Any fire going on at home? I mean, you might not be setting the world on fire, but, but are you, a, is this alive? Are you calling on His name? Are you going, praise the Lord? He answered me yesterday. Christian? That's a living connection. Look at Amos 5, verse 4. For thus saith the Lord unto the house of Israel, Seek ye the salving of your conscience, and some good fellowship and the church picnic and getting to know some nice people. Is that what it says? Boy, that little, little two letter word. What a word. Seek ye. Say it out loud. Me. The Lord says, oh, I, I want you to look for me. Seek ye me and ye shall, ye shall what? Say it out loud. Live. You say, it's been a little dry lately. Boy, those bones are getting dry. God said, that's an easy fix. Seek me. God says, I'll step into your living room. I'll step into your heart. I'll step into your car. I'll step into your morals. And you'll live. God says, Do you, <laughs> are you sure you want me to come? God says, because if you'll swing a door open, he says, I'll come. Would you ask me to come? You know what prayer is? It's like, Lord, are you there? Lord, I, Lord, it's been mighty dry lately. Lord, I know you love me. I know you saved me. Lord, you told me to call. Lord, would you please come? You won't do that long, sincerely. And boy, things will start to thaw out. And it won't be so dry anymore. And you go, Wow. This feels just as good as it did the day I got saved. You know why? Because he hasn't changed. He lives. He lives. Do you know him this morning? Christian? Oh, Christian. Surely the devil hasn't lied to you and told you what a hard taskmaster God is and surely he hasn't filled your ear with that. Surely you haven't let that fill your heart, have you? Tell him to go away and seek the Lord again. God says, you know what a church is about? God, God said, it's about me. And he says, if it's really about me, he says, you'll live. Let's pray. Lord, we pray that every heart 
Lord, that, Lord, something's happening in their heart this morning. Lord, help them to call out to you. Lord, they may feel very unworthy, but God, you loved us without any worthiness whatsoever. We have none. Oh, dear God, let not their unworthiness stop them. God, you were the friend of sinners and you still are. God, help people, help the saved. Lord, that they would seek Thee anew and afresh. God, that they would know You as the giver of their life. In Jesus' name. If God has spoken to you this morning, the piano's going to play. But it'd be a good time to talk to Him. Boy, if you don't know the Lord Jesus, if you don't have that day, you know, that definite event where you said, Lord Jesus, I believe on you with all my heart. Whatever, whatever that means, Lord, whatever, however that's going to change my life, Lord, I want you. I believe you died and I believe you rose from the dead for me. Why don't you call on his name? He will hear you. He will save you now. We got some folks still praying. We're not in a hurry.
Lord Jesus, thank you for your truth and thank you, Father, that um, you offer us life. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the life you've given us. Thank you for everlasting life. God bless now, we pray as we go our ways in Jesus' name.